Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Um, I greet you and uh, welcome you to. Wow, what a show. This is the live podcast outreach uh, for Rehoboth Institute of the Arts. And um, I am so glad that you're here. We, of course, are on a journey to read through the book of John. And uh, we are embarking on that mission right now. And uh, glad that you're here to join in and to be a part of what I'm so glad because you know what? Our quest inevitably is for looking at Jesus Christ through the eyes of faith and discovering what church really should be or what is in the heart of the Lord in having um, joined us together in fellowship in such a way. So uh, we're waiting for our co-host, um, and she's going to join us, Miss Anna Kane, tonight. And, um, you know, always getting in on time and all that for me is still a, a work of art. <laughs> but this is, wow, what a show, and I do welcome you. My name is Phyllis, and I am the host of the Rehoboth Institute of the Arts podcast. So glad that you're here. And uh, to just recap a little bit, uh, in my quest to discover the heart of God with regards to what church should be, I have uh, kind of been led, I believe, by the Holy Spirit, kind of be, that's a crazy way to say it, led by the Holy Spirit to look into the Gospel of John and to recognize the interaction of Jesus Christ with uh, the people, all the people, and also with his disciples in particular, um, to discover how and what went on there as the church is actually being established. He's bringing training to his people uh, who will, you know, lead and guide the, uh, the evangelism of the church. And remember that Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ, is the fulfillment of a prophecy that, that was given to Israel concerning the, um, coming of a Messiah, and Jesus Christ is uh, that Messiah. And we have given credibility to the fact that he is the Messiah uh, in the first chapter, first couple of, what, three chapters, the first three chapters of the book of John, uh, where we see in chapter one uh, how Jesus Christ was in the beginning, and he is the word spoken. He was with God, and he is God. And it continues. Uh, also, we are, we have seen in, um, John chapter two and three that Jesus Christ begins to show him, you know, himself through the eyes first of his mother who raised him and saw that he was unique and different. But also the words had come to Mary that that child born of her would be from the Holy Spirit. He, she was going to be, um, you know, the, the wound of Mary would be, uh, that would be placed the seed that was from the Lord and to fulfill this coming Messiah. So she's watched him all of his days. And fresh and hello, Tony. Hello there. Um, I sent you a link. I did. Then you should be in the co-host seat. I'm sorry. I tried to do it earlier, but sometimes the uh, phone, you know, I can I can schedule these to start at a certain time, but sometimes it'll go on and start right on time. I don't know why. And so I had to rescind your first invitation because I had to end that first <laughs> open podcast. So um, if you look in your email, of course, you will get that that link and be able to join us. And secondly, I want to welcome Tony. So good to see you here. Um, so join in, of course, with comments. We want to hear from you. Tony is going to join us one in one of the readings. I do pray and hope um, so that we get to hear from him again. So will, I hope, Light Touch. So will a few other pe uh, people as we uh, continue with this journey. And in the recap, I'm showing that we have seen Jesus Christ 
uh, as God. It has been established that he is from God, he is God, and he is unique and special. His uh, mom called him to perform a miracle um, that will is established his his power, right? Even though he tells her it was not his time, um, it is in obedience to her a demonstration of who he is. So, um, <clears throat> okay, there's always uh, hmm. well, fresh, and if you would just ask to join me here uh, from where you are, we can indeed get you in the co-host seat. Uh, mummy, it's another moment with our Heavenly Father and we don't take it lightly. Tony, you are absolutely right. We just cannot. And as we're living in these days and watching the way the world is going for the first time in my lifetime anyway, we see a, an aligning of powers, right? Uh, they've always aligned, but we didn't have we didn't have the communication to hear about it, but there, the world is almost divided into two different uh, trains of thought um, with regards to governance, right? And so we are on the precipice of something that we have read about in the Bible. The, um, the prophecies tell us that there will be a, a great war, you know, a battle. And that uh, all all of this is going to come to to pass the ch- climate changing right. We wouldn't be able to tell the change of the seasons except by the budding of trees. But the promise of God stands that there will be seed time and harvest while we are here anyway as people, and we've seen that. But we do see this climate change, and we hear a lot of uh, of talk about it, and uh, we do see the chaos in the world, and we see. Uh, that there are wars and rumors of wars, and they have been. And World War I was said to be the war that would end wars, but it actually wasn't. And many wars have ensued since, right, as had done before. So uh, we are we are really living in a very, very uh, volatile world and a very exciting time almost as we are uh, watching on the prophetic clock or other prophetic screen. So uh, the recap is is showing me the church. We're looking at Jesus Christ. And he's he is the head of the church. He said so. We're looking at him establish the new covenant, walk uh, the disciples and, uh, you know, preach the good news of the coming of the Messiah. So um, I'm, I'm really, really beginning you open my eyes are open and my ears are open to hear what God is guiding us to do. So as we're waiting now for Freshen to kind of dial in and ask to be a part, I would love <laughs> I would love it if you do it real soon, Miss Anna Kane, so we can get into the reading of the um of the third I mean fourth chapter of the book of of uh, the Gospel of John. I always want to say the Book of John, but this one is the Gospel. And uh, we would love to have you join us here. I'm waiting. Hopefully she'll come right along. You know, if you, if you dial, you can, you can request to sit, to say something or to be a part of the live cast. Anna, I don't know if you know how to do that. I did indeed send it. Okay. I don't know how. <laughs> Oh, come on. Yes, you do. You've got to know how. Hmm. I think you touched the, there it is. There it is. Yes, yes, yes. We've sent you the invitation. You yeah, Thank you for that. Okay. So uh, what is amazing now, Anna, uh, you should be coming up real soon. Uh, uh, do it again. If I didn't catch it on time, just keep doing it until you get that, that link to join in. Um, like I said, the, uh, the, the recap shows us uh, a lot. And, you know, I'm going to formulate all of this. Uh, but when I started, I told you that the outline that came to me starts with not what is Christianity, but rather who is Christianity. And, and then we move on to who are the followers of Christ? Because Jesus never said, um, he never said that we were 
Christians, he said that we were to walk in the way. That there is a way. And of course, I think we have to go on and read through the book of Acts to see also uh, some more of the establishment of the church. But the, these first three chapters of John have been really amazing, opening our understanding of who Jesus Christ is. When he came, how he was indeed God, having been with God from the beginning, and then having been made flesh and walked amongst men, being rejected of those to whom he came and grafting in all the whole world. In John 3.16, we saw last week, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And he states it twice. Anna, if you would, please send that invitation again, because once you send it, you should be able to enter. Uh, everything is fine by God's grace, mommy. Yes, all things are well. Uh, and welcome to Sister Reams. Um, okay, so we're trying to get Anna in. She didn't get her invitation for some reason, but she uh, then asked to, you, d- you did the right thing, Anna Kane, so do it again and let me give you the, um, okay, so you, you sent the request to join and I, I, I responded, um, you know, I invited you that way. So if you do it one more time, somehow you, you still, you got this admin thing going on. What's that to me? I don't know what it means. Um, okay. Uh, from this point, I don't, if I go out, I will cut myself off and we'll all have to begin again. So you really do have to do it from your phone as a request to join in from where you are right now. You can do it. Um, just kind of look around there and see. You did it once because I, I saw it and I, I, um, you know, I responded. I tried to catch it. The thing is, it comes at the top of the phone. And so, you know, it, it, it probably was there a second or two before I actually saw it. But I'm looking now. So do it once, once again. And let's get in. And while we, you know, while we're waiting, I'm just keep my eyes open and say an opening prayer here. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we have been so blessed to enter into this uh, quest to study again, Father, to look at you and to see the church because you are head of the church and you have established it and for our good, for our upbeat. Okay. Okay. And we thank you for getting on in tonight and we ask you to bless our uh, conversation, our interaction with each other to make it fall in line with the guidelines, so to speak, the foundational guidelines of what church is. Let us live it to your glory, for your glory, so that the whole world will see and know us by our love, as you said it would be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Amen. So, uh, uh, Anna, you should tap on that little phone icon and um, be able to come up as a speaker. Please tap on that icon. It will it will signal me that you want to come in, and I will there. So it says we've sent your invitation, and now you are a speaker. Praise the Lord, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, there you are. I hear you. Good okay, evening, indeed. <laughs> so. I was uh, a little flustered there because I missed something and then I, I figured it out and I apologize for being yeah. too late, but I was here on time. That's okay. Just not in. <laughs> and then I couldn't log in. A lot of things were happening. So good evening, <laughs> we say good evening and I say welcome. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it over to you now. If you're ready to begin reading or if you want me to read, you tell me so. But I'm going to go on mute so that we can eliminate some of the feedback. It's very minimal, but I hear just the bit, okay? And um, I will unmute when the time comes, okay? So you can take it away now. 
All right. Well, this is a, a joy to be here. It is, uh, especially when you have a little setback. You're always even more happy that God has um, graced us with <laughs> some deliverance here. So we're going to read <clears throat> chapter four, and chapter four is pretty extensive. You've got about, let's see, 42 verses or rather 54 verses. So I will go on and read through it. Maybe that we'll stop and have some conversation along the way, but let's just see how the Lord would um, bless us with his word tonight. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would just, Lord, be the forgiver of sin tonight, God, wherever there's anything that's tainted, anything that's unpleasing, Lord, anything that you would say, hey, that's not worthy of, of, of me being a part, Lord, just cleanse me. Um, help us to rest and to hear your word. That's all we're doing, God. We're speaking your truth and we're being um, taught by it and led by it. And I just pray that all of us tonight would join in together and that we would rightly divide the word of truth. It's for our lives. It's our one life we live. Our, our lives depend on your truth, God. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter four, <clears throat> excuse me. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, when Jesus knew that, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his own son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, thus sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to stop here and say, I thought about this earlier, and I thought about it the first time I read through John this past week. And I said, Lord, this is a good time for us to remember that you really do know our frame. And if we read closely, we see that Jesus was the God man. And when this verse reminds us he was wearied. You sweat when you were a carpenter. You responded to your earthly parents. And I just get encouraged by that because sometimes, you know, we just need to be reminded that no, he really does know exactly what you feel. Not just that God knows everything, but that God in the flesh, Jesus taking on the garment of a man, actually with thirst. So he understands when we thirst when our brothers and sisters are persecuted a lot more than we are, he understands the persecution. And so I love to slow down like Chuck Swindoll did recently. He just slowed down and wanted to create a picture in the mind of the, the audience so that we could really just not read over the words and gather a truth and go on, but to try to imagine ourselves in the seat. So here, this is one of those moments. The Lord has seen that, hey, these Pharisees know that now my disciples are baptizing more. He knows it's about to be the target. He's about to be the target. Who is this doing more than John? And then on his way through Samaria, and we know a little bit about Samaria, right? They were not the friends of the Jews, but he stopped and he was wearied on that journey. So God in his manhood was moving forward on our behalf, okay? Through the tiredness and through all that human beings go through, God can identify. Nonetheless, it was about the sixth hour. Verse 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, give me a drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. If you knew who I was, young lady, <laughs> you would have asked of me. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him 
shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's read that again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Amen. Before I go on, the Lord, I was considering this well. And please say what you might think that well signifies. You might read it and say it signifies the salvation that we have. It signifies the Holy Spirit. But the thing that sort of jumps out is that, you know, lots of people, and I get a little alarmed. Excuse me. I even um, made sure I checked myself some years ago. When we say we have the Lord, we know the Lord, we believe in God. And he says here, look, you've got this water. Literally, it's to quench thirst. But figuratively, right, this is the water that, 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 you know, literally it will not quench. It doesn't even continually quench. But then he takes the water and said, hey, if you knew who it was that talked with you, you would ask for this well of water that would spring up into everlasting life. And I was considering that and saying, Lord, I know you said, let the tares and the wheat grow together. So yes, there's going to be a separation. Unfortunately, all men won't get it. And according to your sovereignty and according to your, you know, sort of this really amazing type of predestination, you know, (laughs) that you just ordained, though you still provide for all men opportunity towards salvation. A lot of times we say we have this well water, right, that God gives, that the Bible says, Christ said, will spring up into everlasting life. So literally that is true. We believe that. But I started wondering about satisfaction with the well water that he gives us literally having the thing that we should, you know, contain within us that causes us not to thirst. Yet at the same time, I I think a situation came up with someone I know in in the walk, sometimes we, we still not satisfied, but I go, how can you not be satisfied Mm. with the thing that satisfies that spring, you know, the, the thing that satisfies it's not, you cannot be thirsty again if truly I have tasted and drunk of this well water. So I started, you know, the, the, the admonishment came quickly. It, it's, it's, you know, as long as we're alive, pray again. When I was younger, I used to go, no, I, you know, you prayed, but then I go, well, how do people know? Like, if you question anything, if you question even whether or not you have asked and received this water, that will spring up into everlasting life. I know that takes us on out of, out of this world when you think of everlasting life, but I honestly believe that it, it does start right now in the relationship with God. And I was just pondering if you have never pondered, shouldn't I be well satisfied? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or is it that we still go around looking for other wells to drink out of Lord and how that must be a little disappointing disappointing or a lot disappointing or I'm reminded of my Lord that he probably already knows that's going to happen because he understands the walk that we walk so just to sort of ponder what the what that that meant we're going to move into what he says to the Samaritan woman but I I did ponder that and I'm still pondering it and um, Mm. just wanted us to consider that I'll never thirst and the only thing we know in our human lives, or you know, we, we, we know what fills the spirit, man. We know where we have a deep satisfaction and that knowing in Christ. That's why people come to Christ and say, then I had meaning. Before I was never satisfied. You know, all the things that we can have or relationships, you know, that was, but then, I, then, I, then they were satisfied. So if we can consider that for ourselves. Am I satisfied, Lord? And if I'm not, you know, what, what am I not tapping into? So that literally this well water that springs up into everlasting life, I can begin to really accept that now and be satisfied in it 
even now. So then 15 says, the woman said unto her, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast said, well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And uh, that saidest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So now God has just revealed himself in a couple different ways. But he, one, he's separated the Samaritan from the Jew. And he says, you go. She's calling, by the way, if you did a little history on who the Samaritans actually were, you'd be quite interested <laughs> in, in that in, in relationship to who the Jews are. But she's, she says, you know, you worship, but you don't know what you're worshiping. But salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship. And there's coming a time, though she can call out and, and, and say, this is of our fathers. We know who gave us this well. But there's something missing here, obviously, right? So she's got the history, but he's got what she doesn't have and what he is offering her. But so the hour comes, he said, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit. And in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him worship him in mm -hmm. spirit and in truth. So the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So what a moment that is. And I almost know it was super spon it was mm. spontaneous. <laughs> Nobody thought she didn't think of anything she would say in that moment. Imagine having to digest that all in the moment. So we'll come back to a couple of things to consider there. And upon them, uh, this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Now, I was going to stop there quickly and go back. And a couple of things that sort of came to mind had to do with her recognition of Christ. She didn't recognize him when he walked up. I've never heard or seen anything that tells me she did. And he speaks to her like Christ does so beautifully. Uh, you know, he, he brings in something you weren't looking for. <laughs> you know, why are you asking me to give you water? So he goes on and we might call it simply put a teaching moment. But really, the Lord is always, uh, you know, using an opportunity uh, in, the, in the scripture, that is, <laughs> to teach us something, to show us something, to reveal himself. And by the way, this is God is being revealed. OK, that whole Still at the beginning of the chapter is showing that John's time is drawing to a close. Jesus is being revealed. The Messiah and John won't share the same stage. And so even with talking with the Samaritan woman and knowing that she will go off and now, you know, um, reveal him to those people who were contrary to the Jews, um, is an opportunity. This is, this is the Lord opening himself up in his, his ministry, as we put it, but he's revealing himself and John's place is now, you know, John's going to have to retreat into the background. Jesus is coming into the forefront. Mm -hmm. So this is very significant to reveal himself in a, in a, in a, in a way to this woman. And notice what it is. Um, the Samaritan uh, knows that only the only person or the only type of person that could know anything about her would be a prophet. So she quickly equates him with a prophet. Um, and that would get her some attention, by the way, <laughs> because you can't just, you know, it, he wasn't going to just guess that she wasn't married or I've seen you. This is going to be significant that she would interpret this man as, as a prophet, prophet, excuse me. So the insight into her life is God driven. And only the prophets have the ability to discern 
that which was not openly known. So again, this is really significant because when she again tells anybody about what just happened, um, that's going to have weight. And so God knows what he's doing. And I just sort of love, I don't know why he does it or when he decided he'd do it. I don't know how many times a day the Lord talks to people this way. But this is really, if we slow down again and try to imagine what's happening here and what's the consequence. Like, okay, so that did happen. There's a ministry that comes on and he always asks the question to the con- congregation, so what? <laughs> and a lot of people might say that when they read certain things in the scripture. Okay, so and? We know he did miracles, but notice where this is in the book of John. It's at the beginning. <laughs> okay, so this at this point in time, this is a big deal. We just digest so much so often, we think it just blends in. But so, so what? He did that. This is significant. I sort of equate it right up there with the, the, him entering Jerusalem almost. You know, this is a turning point in our history. So he goes on, and um, there are a couple of things more we can say about that, but let's move on through the chapter. So, in the meanwhile, while that was going on, Jesus' disciples prayed with him. I'm sorry, let me go back a little bit. The woman left her water pot and she went away in the city and said to the men, come and see. Okay, this man told me everything I've ever done. Um, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, master, they're asking him, master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus said unto him, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men laboreth, and ye are entered into their labors. Let's slow that down a little bit. We're near the end. Again, I don't have all the questions why you... <laughs> But notice the connection here. What Jesus says is that it's his meat to do the will of God. So they ask him, they're getting food for him, literal food, physical food. God God is going to turn that around and give them a spiritual truth. And he's going to give them a charge in this conversation. You know how to discern when the harvest is coming, the literal physical harvest for food. But let me tell you, open your eyes, he's telling them. Okay, the fields, now we're speaking a little figuratively and don't let people fool you. We do it all the time and there's perfect understanding. They look to the Bible and try to say it's some sort of something you can't understand, what's real, what's not. It is real. It's literal, but he's using the literal act to speak to something that we know um, that will be applicable. So it's figurative, right? But the fields are white. There's a harvest. Now I say, Jesus, you said that back then there was a harvest. Truly, there must still be one, a harvest. <laughs> you know, we've received a whole lot more. You've imparted so much more. The wor- world is wider. There must still be a harvest. So really, I'm pretty convicted, if you ever think about it, when I read through what Jesus is saying. He says, he that reaps gets wages. He gathereth fruit unto life. What do you think that means? Life eternal. He that reaps, the ones that reaps, he gets wages and gathereth fruit unto life everlasting. Both he that sows and he that reaps, then we'll rejoice together. What do you all think about that? I won't put words in your mouth, but I think one of the things that comes to our minds would be the sharing of the gospel, the planting of the truth in our world, those people around us. And however way you do it, by the way, because I know we think of things in an evangelistic sense, and that's good. God obviously has ordained men to do that and bless them in it. 
but in the day to day, I think that's where the conviction happens. What about the people around you? What about the longevity of relationship? What about when to go, when to come, how to be, when to give, when not to get? What about those other places where there is a harvest also? What kind of wages? Okay. Um, you know, what are, what's the return? Okay. Being the sower, there are a hundred million ways something can probably be sowed. And then there's always going to be a harvest. But whoever sows in whatever way and however the reaping happens, there's a harvest. And here in this, you know, here in is that saying, one would sow and another reaps. So he says, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. All that had gone before, he is now sending his disciples to go in and to reap a harvest where they didn't labor. Other men, he said, labored. And he's telling them, you entered into their labors. Phyllis, if you ever want to jump in on that, let me know, because I feel like there's a whole lot of conversation behind that. But I'm going to get through the chapter and we can come back. Okay. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. So now he's left. And, you know, because everything in the chapter is sort of (laughs) pushed together, right? Uh, We just keep on moving along. But I want you to sort of slow down and see if God has just spent time. He spent a couple of days. And on his word to one woman, he gathered a crowd. People came. People believed. It's like a tent, you know, a revival or something. They show, he showed up in the city. He's revealing who he is to those who are outside of the fold, so to speak, right? And he's bringing them in. And he's telling his disciples, I've given you a harvest to reap. Or, you know, to, to, to reap. Other men have sown. There have been other labors here. You have the opportunity to now bring them in. And I often wonder, what did disciples do in between these lines here? You know, because there had to be some conversations, people asking questions. What was going on in between the lines that we have here in their daily lives? Were they ministering? Yeah, you know, and we know in Acts especially that they were. But these days when they walk with Jesus, because Jesus is giving them the charge right there when they're with him. So these are amazing times. If you put yourself in there, there's a lot of conversation going on. A lot of people are paying attention to, to the Lord who is revealing himself to the world. So he moves on from there and goes into Galilee. Verse 44, for Jesus said, Jesus, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So he's leaving out of that place and going into another Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Capernaum. And when they had heard that Jesus was come out of Judah into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And when he was now gone, going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. All right, so that's the end of the chapter. Um, And I agree with all the scholars that because... The word, uh, helpfully so, has been put into chapters. Um, you know, sometimes you just need to remember that this is an ongoing sort of uh, writ here. 
and I also see that even within a chapter, <laughs> sometimes I think they had been, should have been divided up into chapters because you've got one scene and then you've got another scene as we have here in another place. And so it's helpful for us to read the Bible and slow down and sometimes stop midway, even a chapter and contemplate what the Lord is showing us in that scene. And here you have a couple of different places where you can slow down. And you can, you know, talk to the Lord about what am I seeing, Lord? Um, what am I getting with this story, quote unquote, of the Samaritan encounter? What am I supposed to receive from that? Is there something applicable? Is it just historical so that I can have an understanding of events moving toward, you know, things? What do I get? So um, a couple of thoughts I had. Um, just moving back a little bit, uh, a question that arises in this chapter would might be, um, again, that issue of satisfaction. Have we drunk of the water that Christ offers? Is there that staying power that the water affords us? And it may seem a little, you know, simplistic, like, well, of course, the answer is yes. Right. Uh, of course, there's staying power. Of course, I was up that water. Um, but I, I do know that because of the temptation um, of the flesh and sometimes the temptation of the enemy, that there might be distractions or there might be moments of dissatisfaction or what you might think is dissatisfaction. And what we say we've received, um, you know, sometimes. I say it, there shall ought to be consistent satisfaction, even amid hardship, even amid disappointment, even amid persecution. I tell you, when I hear about my brothers and sisters in places, I say, God, it's only your power that can do this. It's only your power that can do this. I don't care if they're posing for a picture or not. There's only your power that can cause them to put those words on that page. If these are their words, this is a testimony of that satisfaction. This is a testimony of that well water already springing up into already showing its power. And that is pure satisfaction. Um, are you satisfied? In a general sense and in a specific sense. And in the specific sense, when you really are, you know, needing water, <laughs> when there's a thirst, when there's a drying out, are you satisfied? You know, can I make it? Do we default back to what we've heard all of our lives on TV, from the neighbor, from wherever, you know, just what we want. And, and that's something I think we got to ask ourselves all the time. When I read the word, am I satisfied? You know, I've known some people who like come to the Lord. They, they seem to want to move in the right direction. And I tell you what, I feel like in a month they're dissatisfied. And I'm like, well, gee, you know, hang in there a little while. And I guess on one couple of fingers, I understand that, but on the other hand, I go, well, gee, in my worst days, I would have to have always admitted that, no, God is enough. I don't care. I'm wrong, but he's enough. Like, I always sort of knew that. Like, no, he's right. I'm wrong. Or he's right, and I'm, I'm something, whatever it is. But there was I always knew there was a satisfaction in him, period. End of story. So if you're struggling with that, I would say, Lord, reveal to me, what have I accepted? You know, what, what did I say I want and show me what it is I really need to, you know, how do I need to really look at you, Lord Jesus, the, the salvation that you've given to me? What am I doing with it? Am I tainting it with something, you know, in life? Am I inconsistent in building a relationship with you? And so I'm feeling a little dry. Maybe you're not there. You're not alive in my life. You don't bring me joy. I don't wake up thinking about you. I don't, you're not like a part of my ins and outs, goings and comings, conversations. I don't see you when I'm out and go, boy, that really might like, you know, is there, is there something missing Lord? And I believe that can happen even to the person who confesses Christ because of the way we live. In our habits, we can sort of not have that satisfaction. So uh, maybe just one more thing and we can all share. Um, I think that's any, uh, verse 26. Uh, let's see. 
declaring that he is the Messiah is a confession of his deity. Though people like to say from verse 26, they haven't read 26 and, and others. They like to say that he never said he was God. People like to give him the status of a prophet, which this woman also started with, but they do not like to you know, quote his clear confessions of oneness with God as the confession of messiahship, quote unquote, indicates. And so there are places where the Lord will reveal himself as being one with God, the son of God. He doesn't have to come out directly because he knows the heart of man. We're always, he could answer you directly and tell you, and you still come back and ask him the same question again. We do that with one another every day. <laughs> what did you, are you serious? You know, we, we go back and we doubt truth right in front of our face. Something will come up, I declare, and it will have you that. So, you know, it's not that the Lord wasn't wanting to be direct, but even when he is, we still tend to question it. So that, that verse 26, if you ever, again, the Lord is, revealing himself more he's coming into the forefront the people are recognizing who he is chapter four is helping us to see that unfold and in verse 26 he does clearly let you know that he is the messiah um and if you if you're like me you run into a lot of people who just want to question it i you know, it's getting pretty old too but it's very serious because the same people who um don't want him to be the Lord are the same people who are really against his followers and they will and are showing that um, overtly in their actions, behaviors, and plans for those who follow Christ. So join me, Phyllis, in terms of chapter four. Um, Jesus is greater than John. (laughs) Back in three, the Lord is revealing himself (laughs) to the Samaritans. and there's a lot going. There's a lot we could say, right. but it, it'd be good to share. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've muted you as I talk so that we can um, eliminate some of the feedback. Um, and sometimes, guys, it is because we are in a room, and and it, it's not a studio, right? So even though we're wearing our earbuds and that sort of thing, we pick up background noises that are going on in our homes. And uh, sometimes it's because uh, one make of a phone to another make of a phone doesn't have the kind of connection that weeds out um, uh, noise as with the iPhone to the Android. I've, I'm learning some things as we go. Anna, I think that what you have done, no, no, I think is not the word. What you have done tonight continues to open up for me the understanding of what God has done in establishing his church. And I think it was, of course, the genius of God through and by the Holy Spirit to tell me <laughs> to read through, well, listen to the book of John, uh, the, the gospel of John. I keep saying the book of because there are three, there are three other books that are titled John. This is the gospel as delivered by this disciple, John, who was uh, the beloved. And through his eyes, through the experience of John retelling this story, we see, or I see at least, a tender, loving, close relationship. And for some reason, I hear uh, things that the, that Jesus Christ speaks as revelation of what he knows about men and the fickle heart of men and how men seek to find something uh, exceptional that will supply their own personal lives. And the contrast of that with those who actually experience his love as you have revealed in this chapter as Jesus Christ meets the woman at the well. And I just really, really love and appreciate how you slow us down because I think in this, in this gospel is told we are put at a different pace. We are, uh, settled so to speak, at his feet, and we are able to bask in his presence. I think, you know, that that's what has really captured my heart and my ear and my uh, discernment 
in going through this particular chapter. And fresh and please, by all means, uh, speak as you would like. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Phil, I quickly, and I hope I don't have any disturbance. When you said that, I said to myself, mm. oh, so did I. I recently, I think before we chatted even, I went through and listened mm -hmm. through all of John. And I declare what you just said yeah. is, is what I felt. So I'm over here muted and I'm going, <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, and I, I really, if you've never listened to the Gospels throughout, <laughs> instead of taking them tidbit by tidbit by tidbit, it really yes. does a lot to, 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 to what you're hearing the the presentation of the gospel by that particular writer you, you really get a sense of what yeah. the overarching right scene is and so i that Excellent. resonates with praise me be to god so that validates for me the this new approach this new experience and it comes by the leading of the holy spirit because i am definitely a reader. Give me my Bible in a quiet place in the early morning hours, and I am transported. And so I was really kind of saying, "Okay, really, Lord, listen." And I, I, um, I did. I, you know, I turned on the audio Bible and I began to listen, and I was absolutely astounded. I heard it. I was not distracted, and the the serenity, the the um the movement, the uh, adoration, all of that just lifted up. The the absolute depth and the profundity of the presence of Jesus, God in the flesh, in the world, hit me really with a, with a I, I don't know that I've ever actually uh, discerned it quite that way. So I'm really glad. And I want to uh, just uh, highlight some of the points. <clears throat> Remember, I'm looking for church, but the series is titled uh, Seeing Jesus Through Faith and Fellowship. Faith. John knew that this man, Jesus Christ, was the son of the living God, both Johns and then this one who is right, you know, it's left us the gospel, even though that's controversial. Some people say maybe he didn't write it. We don't know, but I, we believe because it seems that he did. And then John, his uh, forerunner, as was prophesied. And here it is. He's established. We know it. And now we see again him in his godliness in the very person of God that he is, but transported or imported into the realm in which we live to give us a picture and to pay the ultimate cost for the redemption of mankind. This is a beautiful thing. It is absolutely beautiful. And uh, uh, further up, Anna, you ask the question, um, what does that well signify, right? And right away, I hear again the 12th chapter of the book of Isaiah. It that's, It's such a lovely, beautiful, beautiful rendering of us being able to uh, draw from the well, from the well of salvation. It is deep. It is wide. It is... Uh, Broad, it is high, it is the fullness of Jesus' benefits to us. When we come to salvation, every need is met. I love your discussion also on being satisfied. Does he satisfy you? Yes, he satisfies us. When you really have been born again of the water, which I am going to stand uh, on as being not only the, the symbolic baptism, but the word of God, because the word is present. The word became flesh. And so when the word went into the water, it was a demonstration <clears throat> of that symbolic dive into the, 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 the grave, perhaps, but 
more than that for me. It is the word that is also the water. It became the water. And at the time of his baptism, the dove did light there because he, the, the Lord had told John that that's how he would he would show him with whom he would be well pleased, who he, the Messiah, is. And that's what he did. He showed him there that day. And um, so for me, if you haven't read the 12th chapter of Isaiah, it's, a, it's beautiful. I'm telling you, it's like a song it, as a, as a um, I'm not a poet, nor am I a composer. But when the Holy Spirit Im, Im, impresses me with a particular um, ability to speak poetically or to uh, compose a song. I take it to be for me, uh, just for me, not that it's going to ever bless anyone else. But of late, I'm finding that when I share, it does indeed speak something to someone else. So I invite you to read that song in Isaiah 12. For me, it is a song. For me, it is an ultimate of what God has done for us in giving us this great, great salvation. And also, Anna, you brought out the point that we are called to share this gospel, right? This is God's church, and we don't do anything, right, that hasn't been already planted in our... When we go out and we are, uh, you know, sharing the gospel, Jesus Christ has already been lifted up. That, that cross is already there. That payment is already there. It is just a matter of someone receiving the gift. And I think that evangelism is us just telling them, there's a gift waiting for you over there. Why don't you go pick it up? You see, that's what we're doing in sharing. We're giving witness to what we have also received. And Jesus tells the disciples um, here in is that saying true, as you brought out on in uh, uh, verse uh, 37? Uh, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereupon you bestowed absolute no labor. You didn't work for it. Other men labored. See, because before us, there have been through the generations those who have not only shared, but many who have also given their lives that this great gospel can continue into future generations. And so we go out and when we do the work, we are entering into the labors of others. And ultimately, we're entering into the work of Jesus Christ because he also has laid that foundation. He also lifted was lifted up on the cross and paid that ultimate price. This has been beautiful. I could go on and on, but I'm not trying to repeat all that you said. I took a great deal of notes because they're going to support me in the uh, the opening up of this outline that God has given me. So now we know who is Christianity, right? If, if we just must use the word and we were called that. And for the ages, we've been called Christians. That I-A-N, if I remember in my grammar class and someone can correct me, it simply means to be like or like another, right? So as we say we are Christians, we're saying we are like Christ or those people are saying that we are like Christ. How like him are we truly? And are we really walking in what he himself said is the way? You see, he is the way. He really is the way. And if you can think of the way as a path, a, a road, um, or a, a direction, you will be closer to being in the way, you know, and being like Christ because we really do follow him. We really do the things that he has said we shall do and that by the empowerment of the spirit once he was taken out of this world. Um, it's been it's been wonderful. It has been absolutely wonderful. And I so thank God that you have come and definitely she will come again. I want to read now from uh, our uh, audience, uh, if you would, uh, and and um, Anna, you can comment on anything that is uh, listed here. Maybe you 
I have now had a time to read through some of them, but I'm going to scroll and uh, <laughs> I read some of these great, great uh, comments. Excuse me. Glory be to God. He is the God who sees. In that seeing, he understands my every experience, every struggle and trials and has given me every triumph. Amen. Praise be to God. That was from Light Touch. And here, I mean, uh, yeah, Light Touch Prayer House entered. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming and joining us. Your comments are always welcome. Amy and Truck Jewels, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. And I want you to know that I am, when I am not the host, I can send out invitations. But most like, you know, most of the time I am the host. So doing all of these things at the same time <laughs> is difficult. So I don't send them out every week, but definitely I want to do that. I want to be faithful. I don't send them to say, please remember me and come. I send them because some people have requested and some people have trouble getting in. Uh, then again, Light Touch writes, life truly is more than food and drink. Although we need food, a believer's food and drink is the will of the Most High. It is to do his will. Amen. As Jesus Christ also said, it. absolutely nothing else is as satisfying as the digestion of God's love, his peace. Only my needs have finally shown me this. No matter how great the relationship, meals, family, lovely clothes, etc., they all fade. The luster wears off. I'm telling you, if you live long enough, right, or if you have enough trials, you will come to understand that. Um, and light touch agrees this. And so I'm going, going, going. Uh, we have, I'm sorry, did someone speak? That was me. I, I was just sort okay. of commenting on what you were saying. Go, go on and keep reading. I Please do. Go ahead. Speak. Uh, just thinking about, um, uh, something I actually read reminded me of that entering into the labor that has already started. I was reminded that some of that labor, you know, can look overwhelming. People always look outward. What do I do out there somewhere um, as I enter in? But as you know, um, family, uh, it, it's a field. <laughs> okay. Uh, friends, work, uh, everything that's close to us is a field. But those places that are far off are also fields. And if you don't know, um, where your niche is, if you're not quite sure where you're being productive, I would encourage you to pray like I've seen in my own life. There are other places that I can support, pray for. You can always pray. You can always hear a student or a neighbor share their life with you. Boy, you got enough to go for the mm -hmm. you know, next five years usually. So there's a harvest out there. And, and in America still, we still have the word of God open there are still billboards that say jesus lives there are still churches whether it doesn't matter who's in there there's always a reminder still and we would hate to live in a place where they have broken down everything that you can barely remember that christ was once named there so while we have our opportunity let's look at our fields wherever they may be I look at them at my, with my students all the time. You know, I pray for people who are close to me that I feel distant from all the time. I have to, you know, remember, no, no, no. There's a calling and there's a reaping. My God is actually going to, the ultimate reaper. So am I doing anything with what he put in my hand to do? And so entering into the labor, there's already started. I didn't start this. I came in on the scene. He blessed me, granted me with a little bit of understanding. He gave me eternal life. Mm -hmm. I didn't give it to myself. <laughs> so where do I fit in this world, God? Quietly or loud, where do I fit? And then we can enter into person by person. And then, you know, as we pray. So I just want to admonish everybody to, there's yes. always somebody. Yes. There's always some place. And ask God where to put your money, where to put your time, where to put your energy, and, your, and, and go for it. You don't have to follow the crowd. Go for where he meets you day to day. And you start to think, hey, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I can enter in there and be productive and bring my God a harvest. When he comes back, he'll say, you've done a good job of what I gave you. And that's a scary thought on one hand. Mm. It's a really warm thought on the other hand. Well, you've given me something. 
He gave the widow her might, and she's been <laughs> talked about ever since. You know, people have millions of dollars. You don't know who they are. You know, he gives some people lots of friends. You have no idea who they are. You have this one story of this one isolated incident. You know, mm. whatever it is, be happy with it. Don't be envious of other people. Go with your own life. You'll be super satisfied talking to the Lord Jesus all the time, having a great life. Do not be envious of other people's yes. and other situations. Just be happy with what he gave you. This is a mm. five-talent, ten-talent <laughs> deal here. It's what he gave you. Go with it. Mm. Go with Glory that. Glory indeed. That May God be Lord praised. Jesus. You know, there was just so many nuggets that I, I probably will recap. Um, and, and I didn't start at the at the top. But Jesus Christ, right, uh, it is written in the book of Hebrews, is not a God that is distant. He can be, he was uh, in the experience of who we are. So it's written there that he can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points, such as we, uh, he suffered. He, he was, you know, he had that experience and that without sin. So he was ultimately here to empower us, to give us, to teach us, to show us the way. But he also understands absolutely on. And I think if if we don't do so much in the way our programs, right, like you go to church and there's a, you know, the this little ministry and that ministry, and I'm not against any of that. But sometimes I think that when, when you are around that sort of uh, organization of things, structure, you might think that you need that in order to do a thing, right? But Anna, you have clearly laid it out. Whatever, whatever you have to give, however you are moved in your heart to give, it's, it's like Paul said, you know, make, make up the offering before I come. Get, get that out of the way. Don't be motivated by me being there in whatever God says to do do that, right? And Paul was satisfied with that. And that's what we should be. Uh, know that the Lord and uh, well, the Holy Spirit is always guiding and leading us, right? And when we spend time with Him, we hear Him, and so we just follow Him. We end our prayer with um, now. Uh, what is it, John? Uh, oh my gosh! Now, light touch, help me out a little bit. Um, I am weird. We're His sheep. We hear His voice, and we follow Him, and we will not hear the voice of a stranger. Capture that in your heart, and. And believe that, right? Uh, by faith, walk with that. And you will fulfill the mission of sharing the gospel. Uh, Light Touch wrote, really a very good elimination of chapter four. Really good. Wow, what a show. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Like precious oil poured on my head, running down Aaron's beard, says it goes on to say in the psalm, how lovely. How lovely, how lovely. Thank you, Pastor Thomas. Praise the Lord. Very good rendering, fresh and nice picture. Uh, gift over there. Why don't you go pick it up? May God be praised. Great, great show. Thanks. We are so good. Thank you, Miss Honor, for breaking it down. It comes from Reams. Great evening to all. Blessed <laughs> rest to all. Um, and for those who have liked the show, thank you, Truck Jewels uh, team did enter. Some people live out in the boonies and it's hard for them to get in. I just thank God every time uh, the dear sister Teeny comes in because I know that she has that issue. Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father for believers and his disciples that we have his joy inside of us. Hallelujah and amen. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And that's where we end tonight. The Come on, guys, right? When you dine at his table. Mm, 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 mm. Think about it. We are in the world dining at his table. But when we shall be in the eternal place, when we are established in the eternity of the kingdom and we are at the supper, I don't know if that's literal or if it is figurative at this point, but I suspect it is truly literal. We will be at the supper, the Lamb's Supper. In celebration, being so near and close to one another, love will permeate the space and we will not ever need or want 
We uh, never again, and we will we will not have to anticipate a death or a sickness, and our brothers and sisters won't. What a grand time. But God is giving us a little taste of that heaven right now. And so we thank him for this great, great evening and gathering. Thank all of you for coming. And I ask that God will bless you immensely, that something you've heard will touch you deep within, that you will rediscover a closeness with our Father that you may be new at one point, lost, but maybe never knew. And you will come into, into the space that he occupies. By the way, he's everywhere. So you're there and you be, will be aware. May our God be praised. Thank you. Anna Cain, God bless her. Give to her everything that she needs. Provide abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's what you do. Father, thank you that it is not for us just the miracle. It is the relationship that we have now with you. And we leave this evening giving you praise and thanks and we go out with great joy knowing that you've established these just for us. Thank you. We are one beautiful family all over the world and I thank God for such unusual connection. Isn't he wonderful, Tony? I love you so much. (laughs) Thank you guys. Have a wonderful, you know, you don't want to let go when it's been so sweet, right? But we all have to sleep and therefore It's the end of a wonderful day. And on the uh, the morrow, in the morning, on the, when the dawn comes at that moment, you will uh, have been protected through the night. And once again, we will enter into the new mercies of God, his faithfulness for the day as he has been faithful through the night. Thank you all. May he be praised forever and ever. We go out rejoicing. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your night and join us again next Wednesday. Lord, I wish we were reading every day. This is food. May God bless you.